What's up geeks and welcome to the channel. Imagine you're chilling on Netflix, minding your own business, when suddenly you receive a text message saying that your credit card was suspended. In a rush, you call the bank and attempt to fix this, and the first thing you hear is a robotic voice asking if English is your preferred language. Then after wasting several minutes of your life, you get to speak with a live operator who has no idea what you are talking about. Eventually, after a while, and after they connect you with the right person, your issue is resolved. What you experienced here besides stress is the propagation of your request from one operator to another. If at any point in time the operator you are speaking to does not know how to address your problem, he or she will transfer you to the next one because it isn't their responsibility to handle the issue you are encountering. Now, if you were to represent this scenario as classes and methods in an application, you will notice that the operators you are talking to constitute a chain of handlers, where each handler is responsible for one single task. Therefore, the problem encountered will be initially checked by the first handler or operator in this example, and as long as the operators think that there is still hope in solving your issue, they will keep transferring you to another operator until you reach the last one. Additionally, any handler can decide not to pass the request further down the chain and effectively stop any further processing. This example and many others are perfect real-life analogies to the chain of responsibility design pattern. This pattern is a behavioral design pattern that lets you transform particular behaviors into stand-alone objects called handlers. Then, upon receiving a request, this request will pass along the chain of handlers where each one can decide either to process the request or pass it to the next handler in the chain. Okay, before attempting to implement this pattern using a more practical example, let's take a look at the structure or class diagram of the chain of responsibility design pattern and try to relate it to the example we just had. Let's start with the concrete handlers, which are the operators in the previous example. These classes contain the actual code for processing requests. They are usually self-contained and immutable, accepting all necessary data just once via the constructor. These concrete handlers implement a common interface, the handler interface. It usually contains just a single method for handling requests, but sometimes it may also have another method for assigning the next handler in the chain, just like a linked list. The base handler is an optional class where you can put the boilerplate code that's common to all handler classes. Usually, this class defines a field that stores a reference to the next handler. Finally, the client composes the chain of handlers. This can be done once or dynamically depending on the application's logic. Additionally, the request he composes can be sent to any handler in the chain. It actually doesn't have to be the first one. Let's go ahead and try to implement the chain of responsibility pattern. To do this, suppose you are working on an authentication app, and for a user to log in into our platform, he or she must pass several checks. First, we need to make sure that the username entered indeed exists in our server databases, and if not, we have to prompt the user and suggest him or her to sign up. Next, if the username exists, we need to verify that the password entered by the user matches the corresponding password tied to this username. And if not, we must alert the user that the password entered is incorrect. Finally, if both these checks are validated, we need to go over the admin users of our application, because if the user that is trying to log in is an administrator, we perhaps may have to enable additional admin pages for him, or grant him specific rights, etc. Okay, I'll start off the implementation with the database class. This one will simulate the database storing the usernames and passwords of our users with the help of a hash map. You could have established a connection with the real database, but I am not going to waste time doing it here as it isn't the main target of our video. So, in the constructor, we are going to insert a couple entries inside the map, and we'll add to this class two helper methods, one for each of the checks we need to do. The first one will check if the user exists in our records, and the second method will make sure that the password provided corresponds to the username the user has entered. Now, let's go ahead and create the handler abstract class. This one, as we previously mentioned, will store a reference to the next handler in the chain. It will also define a method that allows us to assign this reference like a setter for the next handler. Moreover, this class will contain an abstract method, the handle method. This method will be implemented by the concrete handlers, where each one will define the condition based on which the user is eligible to access our application. You could go ahead and move this method to an interface, and make the handler class implement this interface. 
However, in this case, and as we saw in the structure diagram of the chain of responsibility, the current handler class will become the base handler, and the interface should be named handler as we previously discussed. We are going to proceed without an interface and add to the handler abstract class one last method. This method will house the convenient default behavior of the handler, which is to forward the request to the next object unless there is none left. Concrete handlers will be able to use this behavior by calling the parent method. Speaking of concrete handlers, we have three. The user exists handler, the valid password handler, and the role check handler. Each one of these handlers must implement or override the handle abstract method. Inside this method, we will have a condition that calls the corresponding helper method defined at the level of the database class passed to the constructor. Or in case of the role check handler, the condition will be defined directly inside the handler itself. And based on this condition, we need to verify whether to forward the user to the next handler in the chain by calling the handle next method implemented at the level of their parent class, or execute some other logic specific to the handler currently processing the user's request. Now, if our application held an authentication service class, ideally this class will have a handler as field and as parameter to its constructor. This handler should be used inside a login-like function that invokes the handle method on the root handler of the chain. If this method returns true, then the user passed all the checks in the chain and was authorized inside our application. This authentication service, along with the chain of concrete handlers, should be initialized by the client where the whole logic we implemented will be set to motion. So, as a recap, you should use the chain of responsibility pattern when you encounter the need to execute several handlers in a particular order. As provided, requests will get through the chain exactly as planned. Additionally, this pattern is useful when the handlers and their order might change at runtime, because you have the ability to insert, remove, or reorder handlers dynamically. Each handler in the chain must make two decisions when receiving a request. It will either process the request, or it will pass it along the chain. Finally, concerning the client, he may trigger any handler in the chain, not just the first one, and the request will be passed along the chain until some handler refuses to pass it further, or until it reaches the end of the chain. So, that's it for this video. I hope it was helpful. Thank you guys for watching, take care, and I will see you in the next one.